feel really blessed too. Finish up, finishing up. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. The joy of the Lord is <coughs> strength. It has been what no say. Thank you, Lord. Father, bless all these prayers. Father, in the name of Yeshua, you hear every one of them. You have angels, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. You are prayer hearing, prayer answering, Father God. Lord, listen to your children pray. Lord, send your spirit, we pray. Lord, listen to your children pray. Send 
Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Come on, join me. Oh, Lord, listen to your children pray. Oh, Lord, send your spirit in this place. Oh, Lord, listen to your beautiful friends. Oh, send us love, send us power, send us Come on, everyone, listen, sing along. Oh, Lord, listen to your children pray. Oh, Lord, send your spirit in this place. Oh, Lord, listen to your children pray. Send us love, send us power, send us still be, uh, take some time after our service if you want me to anoint, uh, if anyone wants me to anoint you with oil, um, you know, after our service when we're done, uh, we're going to have some prayer time, okay? Uh, you know, um, uh, Lord knows our needs, amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, you have a special treat uh, this morning before I, before I go on, I want to say let's prepare our hearts. Next week we're going to take the Lord's Supper. Okay, we haven't done it for a little while, um, and uh, I guess next Shabbat would be what, Palm, Palm uh, Shabbat? <laughs> Palm Shabbat? You're in the yeah. One of my favorite cartoons was Charlie Brown saying that he was sitting under the, uh, the psalm tree. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, to write the lyrics to the psalms. But uh, we'll, we'll take the Lord's Supper next Shabbat. Uh, together during the service. And it's good to take the Lord's service and scripture. Rav Shul said, as often as you take it, right? So we're supposed to take it often. Amen? Amen. Today, Rabbi is getting a break. Uh, I kind of uh, checked uh, my calendar, my schedule. Uh, I was supposed to be away next Shabbat, but God has, uh, in his sovereignty, uh, kind of um, uh, uh, rescheduled um, a trip I was going to take to Joplin, Missouri, of all places. Um, friends of mine uh, are now serving the Lord in Joplin, uh, Missouri, a wonderful new church called New Creation. Um, they moved uh, there from here. Uh, and I was there a couple of years ago, five weeks before that horrific tornado hit uh, that wiped out over half the city. But anyways, uh, as uh, Providence, when we were talking about Providence, amen? You know, God is uh, coincidence or God incidence, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, I'll be doing that trip instead uh, at the end of September. Uh, so uh, I looked at my calendar and I just felt like, um, you know what, I'm starting now to have a very intense speaking schedule. Uh, actually, it started this week. And for the next three, four weeks, it's going to be just really, really uh, very intense for me. Please, please keep me in prayer. Pray for me that the Lord especially during the, on the road and travels. Um, uh, some of this will be, you know, uh, full banquets right after I get done with my school bus run. So, uh, and then on occasion like this Sunday, I'll be gone both morning and evening. Uh, so I just appreciate your prayers here, next, especially in the next three weeks. But um, I've asked uh, Brother Steve to come and share a message with us this morning. Uh, Steve isn't ordained uh, with the uh, International Assemblies of God. He also does hospice work. Uh, really appreciate him and his family. Uh, and so this morning, um, I get to sit and, uh, and also be ministered to. And let's just open our hearts and uh, receive a good word from our brother, uh, pastor, well, Reverend uh, Steve Hubbard. Okay? Praise the Lord. One of the things that I miss about being upstairs is the mirror. I don't know how much you guys get a chance to, to turn around and look, but there are a lot of times while, while 
we're ministering in music and you guys are singing that things are happening in this in, in this room that are just they're awesome to people. <laughs> You ever wonder sometimes when I put down my horn and I'm not singing, I'm not playing? It's because I'm overwhelmed by the the spirit of the Lord in this in this place, the Ruach Hakadosh. Uh, <clears throat> I uh, have a whole bunch of stuff on my mind, and I'm working very hard to wipe it away. Uh, God has been dealing with me on a couple of, of very important issues recently, and as I was thinking about what I might say, um, he basically drove me back to the basics. And so, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to go back to an old theme that uh, I first first heard uh, from Yeshua uh, about 40, what year is this? Yeah, 40 40 years ago, last summer, in fact. <clears throat> um, well, first off, let me say, in case you didn't know, God loves you. And that's the title of, of my message. I can't get a whole lot more basic than that. When I studied uh, public speaking in college, my speech professor said three rules. <clears throat> These three rules you got to do, otherwise you can't get a decent grade. And the, the, the first one is, tell them what you're going to tell them. The second rule is, tell them. And the third rule is, tell them what you told them. So what I'm going to tell you is, God loves you. Yes. And if that's all you remember mm -hmm. from, from what I have to say, I will have achieved my goal. And I hopefully it's, it's his goal as well. Um, as I say, in order to get a good grade in that class, uh, I, I had to tell you those things. Now, I'm not looking for a good grade now, but I love to tell stories. I love to tell the story. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that, as Paul Harvey would say, is the rest of the story. Now, I've got a couple of ground rules, actually three that I've, I've written down here, that I'm going to need your help with. First one is, I'm excited. Well, that's not the ground rule, but that's part of the reason for the ground rule. It may be a little surprising to see a man of my stature confess to being hyperactive. But I am hyperactive. And uh, since I lost, well, I've lost 160 pounds in the last three years. Wow. Praise the Lord. As a result, my, my hyperactivity no longer has anything to contain it, and I, I get kind of wound up, and it's scary to see somebody as big as I am in, in full hyperactive mode. And I've had some coffee this morning, although I spilled half my mug. Um, and on, on top of that, in the uh, late 80s, I spent a year as a, a DJ on a Christian radio station, <laughs> and part of the job there was to learn how to read the news very fast and get all the words out very quickly and be able to string all the words together in such a fast, quick manner so that I get 15 minutes of news into a 10-minute broadcast. So I can, however, if I do that, it will be very difficult for you to follow. So if I do do that, I'm giving you permission right now to say, stop, Steve. So let's practice that. One, two, three. Stop, Steve. Come on. <laughs> Somebody out there has had some coffee this morning, I'm sure. Anybody had coffee this morning? You were nodding your head like, like you know what I'm talking about, the effects of coffee anyway. Let's try that again. Stop, Stop Steve. Steve. Okay, that's better. Well, let's get into it. <clears throat> Join me in prayer. I feel a lot saying that since uh, James was praying for me in the, last, in the last song, and then we were praying over here. A, a quick word from the rabbi as, as, as we passed here. But <clears throat> join me, if you will, in, in the words of Psalm 19. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Now that's from Psalm 19, verse 14. When I was growing up in church too long ago, that was... That was always the first words of the, the pastor's sermon, and it was always a sign that the ushers in the church would dim the lights, 
and half the congregation would fall asleep. <laughs> so I, you know, sort of like Pav's log, Pavlov's dog. You know, instead of the bell ringing and me salivating, the you know I hear that verse and I. <clears throat> so if you're inclined to do that, go ahead. I, I, I'm going to get real excited in a couple of minutes, and you'll wake up again. And you'll know when that you'll know when that happens. Um, well, at least I hope it's really exciting. Um, I'm going to read from the Gospel of John, Yohanan. And uh, I'm going to be in the third chapter. I'm going to read from a slightly different translation. I've, I've played a little joke on, on Rabbi before service. I read from the Orthodox Jewish Bible, which has about half the words in Hebrew. <clears throat> um, I can't follow it well enough to do that myself. So I, I want to I read this passage to you from the uh, New Living Translation because it flows more like a story. And so for, for a couple of minutes while I do this, I'm going to invite you to close your eyes, don't nod off, but just picture this scene. Uh, after dark one evening, a Jewish religious leader named Nicodemus, a Pharisee, came to speak with Jesus. Teacher, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are proof enough that God is with you. Jesus replied, I assure you, unless you are born again, you can never see the kingdom of God. What do you mean? exclaimed Nicodemus. How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, the truth is, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives new life from heaven. So don't be surprised at my statement that you must be born again. Just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it comes from or where it is going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. What do you mean? Kind of persistent. Jesus replied, you are a respected Jewish teacher, and yet you don't understand these things? I assure you, I am telling you what we know and have seen. Remember that phrase. And yet you won't believe us. But if you don't even believe me when I tell you about things that happen here on earth, how can you possibly believe it if I tell you what is going on in heaven? For only I, the Son of Man, have come to earth and will return to heaven again. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so I, the Son of Man, must be lifted up on a pole, so that everyone who believes in me will have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God did not send his Son into the world to condemn it but to save it. And there is no judgment awaiting those who trust him. But those who do not trust him have already been judged for not believing in the, Son of, in the only Son of God. Their judgment is based on this fact. The light from heaven came into the world, but they loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. They hate the light because they want to sin in the darkness. They stay away from the light for fear their sins will be exposed and they will be punished. But those who do what is right come to the light gladly, so everyone can see that they are doing what God wants. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> now, a little background, and I'm going to try not to be too academic, but this is the best time to take a nap if you're, if, if you're inclined. Uh, this was written by John... Uh, often referred to as the disciple whom Jesus loved. In fact, nowhere in the gospel does it say written by John. It only talks about the disciple whom Jesus loved. He was the youngest of the apostles, and he lived the longest. Uh, tradition says John was Jesus' nephew uh, through Salome, who was Joseph's daughter, but not Mary's daughter. Got that? Um, 
Later in life, late in life, he was exiled by the Emperor Domitian to an island prison. We call it the Isle of Patmos, which is where it is believed he wrote the book of Revelation. He died around 100 AD, probably in Ephesus, where tradition says that he and, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, went after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Now, some people believe this gospel was written by a disciple of John's after he died um, to preserve John's teaching, much like the gospel of Mark is actually preserving the teachings of Peter. Um, now, to me, that doesn't make a whole lot of difference whether it's John or John's disciple because it's the same message uh, being brought. And I, I like to think of, of John, uh, <clears throat> one of the, one commentator making a guess as to when it was written talks about some of the references to the temple in the present tense would suggest that the gospel was written before the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. So let's just take that as a, as a possibility right now and think if, if John was writing this uh, around 68 or 67, so Jesus has been dead for roughly 30 years, I should say. His earthly ministry has been over for about 30 years. Um, uh, written copies of the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke have already been in circulation throughout the Christian community. And uh, those three Gospels are very similar. They tell much the same story. And I think that the community had a, a unified concept of what Jesus taught while he was here on earth. And that's why those three Gospels are very similar. But if we sat down right now and asked Rabbi to tell us about um, the, the uh, Jesus renewal in the late 60s, early 70s, what he would tell us now would be radically different from the things we would have heard from people during that time. And that's because some of the messages of that time have been lost, some things that he thinks uh, should be emphasized aren't emphasized in the books that are written about, you know, the early days of Jews for Jesus and so forth. And I think that John is, is in this category, that he knows what Matthew, Mark, and Luke contain in terms of information about Jesus. And in his mind, there are things that we've sort of lost track of about Jesus. The people he's talking to are more like my grandson than my wife. They don't know what I'm talking about when I say the Jesus revolution of the late of the early 70s or the uh, charismatic renewal of about the same time. So when I talk to him about those things, it's ancient history. Um, he can read the books, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and get that. But otherwise, um, I have to tell him what I think is important about those times. And so that's what I think John is doing in the Gospel of John. Um, the, the church community at this point is more Gentile and less Jew, uh, more Greek-speaking and less Hebrew or Aramaic, Aramaic, and relatively few are, are remaining who were actually walked with Jesus. Um, and so I like to think of John as, a, as an old man, kind of my age. I guess I'm not really old, but for then I would have been old. Um, telling stories to the younger generation, like my grandson, stories that John knew because he had been there with Jesus when it happened. Now, I, I threw in a couple of comments as I was reading the, the lesson, the, the, the passage, I said, remember that phrase. John talks about who he knew and what he knew now, we often use the words know and believe interchangeably. And they're not really the same word. There is a difference between know and believe. And the best way to talk about that difference in my mind is to tell a story. Of course, just about everything in my mind is best by telling a story. Um, and so I want you to imagine um, a, 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 
a rather gruff looking character, flannel shirt, ratty blue jeans, out in the woods around a 55 gallon oil drum with fire, and, and he's a ho what we used to call a hobo. Uh, I don't know what they would call them today. Do you know what a hobo is? Okay, yeah, a homeless person out in the woods, um, sort of a, a Grizzly Adams character, but without the bear. And uh, uh, in this story, he's in the he's in his element. He's there at the 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 fire ring, the fifty five gallon oil drum, and they're burning sticks and logs. And there's this new guy from the Bronx. Are you Bronx or Brooklyn? Brooklyn. Brooklyn. <coughs> Sorry. Didn't mean to insult you. <clears throat> so there's this young man from Brooklyn, <clears throat> and he doesn't know trees, never mind woods and fires. And of course, out in the out in the woods around a campfire, what do you do? Sing stories. You sing songs. You yes. tell stories. You roast marshmallows. Yeah. Okay. S'mores. S'mores. Right. <clears throat> well, this being Lent, we're going to skip the chocolate. Just, just go with marshmallows. Now, this, this old guy is a really expert roaster of marshmallows. He knows where to put his marshmallow so it gets toasted nicely. If it gets burnt, he gets blown out very quickly so it doesn't all get burnt. He knows not to put his fingers on it too fast because then the fingers, you know, the melted marshmallow. But this young guy from Brooklyn doesn't know marshmallows. Um, and so they're gathered around the fire and, and, and they're cooking their marshmallows and this is the new experience from the guy from, for, the, for the kid from Brooklyn and as always happens to, to novice marshmallow roasters his marshmallow catches on fire falls off the stick, goes into the fire and he goes to reach for it and the old man says, no, 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 no leave it alone it's hot, it's burning you get that on your fingers, you're going to get burned and the new kid from Brooklyn says, I believe that. He believes that. Well, they go on through the day and, and, and continue their roasting their marshmallows. And eventually the bag runs out. Now, our, our, our old grizzled hobo is an experienced marshmallow roaster. So he has a leather pouch on his belt that we used to get from head shops. And it's got six individually wrapped marshmallows in his leather pouch. Now, this is sort of a pop culture communion. Uh, I, I have prepared individually wrapped uh, marshmallows to, uh, to, to pass out. Don't open them yet, but, but take one and, and, and hold on to that and just contemplate marshmallows. <laughs> Now, our, our old guy, we'll call him John because he represents John in the, in the gospel, <clears throat> has been telling stories about his life on the road, and they've run out of marshmallows, and so he breaks into his private stash, pulls out these individually wrapped, passes them around, and the kid from Brooklyn is so excited because he thought he was done with marshmallows, he gets one more chance to roast the perfect marshmallow. And he gets a little sloppy, and his marshmallow catches on fire. Now remember, he believes that if he puts his finger on that marshmallow that's burning, that it will burn him. But he doesn't know this. It's not a heart knowledge kind of thing. It's a, it's a head knowledge. I believe, yeah, fire, hot, burn, ouch. But being kind of cocky, and you know, everybody from Brooklyn's kind of cocky, at least everybody I know from Brooklyn is, right? <laughs> he thinks he can reach in real fast, grab that marshmallow out of the flames, pull it out, rescue it, blow it out, and, and it will be saved and he can have that one last marshmallow. So, of course, what he does is he does exactly that. He moves so quickly that the John can't stop him, reaches in the fire, grabs that marshmallow, his kipper falls off, And thank you. Did you give one to Eddie? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> he uh, reaches in, grabs that marshmallow, pulls it out of the fire, and he's got five little bonfires, one on each finger. And he's going, ah! 
in that instant, he goes from believing in the fire to knowing of the fire. Now, I intentionally called him John because I want you to think of John telling these stories to the, the Christian community 30 years after Jesus has left the earth, and John is telling the church things that he knows. Now, go ahead and unwrap your marshmallow and enjoy it. <laughs> but I want you to think as you're enjoying that, that uh, what is it I wanted you to remember? Knowing. God loves us. Yes, God loves us. That's right. Whenever you have a marshmallow for the rest of your life, I want you to remember, God loves you. In fact, God loves you so much that if you had been the only person here on earth who needed redemption, he still would have gone up on the cross for you. God loved you so much. Now, what a marshmallow has to do with that, other than my story, I don't know. But I want you to look at marshmallows for the rest of your life and think, God loves me so much that if I'd been the only person here on earth who needed redemption, he still would have gone up on the cross for me. Okay, back to the academic stuff. Uh, there is a fairly obvious key verse to this passage that I read from the Gospel of John, and it's the very first verse I ever memorized. Now, the church I grew up in didn't go for memorizing Scripture, but I had a buddy that took me to a Baptist summer camp thing, and they had a prize bag of M&M's for anybody that could memorize a verse. And I memorized the verse. And you guys know the verse too. It's the football fan's favorite verse. Amen. Every time there's a there's an extra point or a field goal, Super you Bowl. see the sign up in the in the stands, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but shall have everlasting life. Now I'm thinking about marshmallows. <laughs> now, my application in my mind for this, um, I want to tell you a little bit about a little bit about my history. <coughs> Rabbi mentioned that I'm ordained, actually fairly recently. I was just ordained. That's been two years now, hasn't it? Uh, something that happened as a result of almost losing my foot four years ago. Um, sort of a miraculous story there, but I'm not going to share that one now. I'm going to show you share one from 40 years ago. Uh, <clears throat> I want to tell you about how I met Jesus, or when I met Jesus. Now, who remembers Jerry Garcia? And I don't mean the ice cream. <laughs> you don't know who Jerry Garcia is. <laughs> Well, I was saved because of Jerry Garcia. Really? <laughs> and you're grateful. For those of you who don't remember that name, you probably remember Grateful Dan. He's grateful. And when I was 15, in fact, exactly six months after my 15th birthday, I went to a Grateful Dead concert at the University of Maryland. And because I was a poor teenager without a job, I got the cheapest tickets I could, which meant I was in the last row in the nosebleed section at the uh, field house at the University of Maryland. Now, <clears throat> everybody knows Grateful Dead concerts are full of marijuana smoking and hash and all sorts of other interesting things. Before I went to this concert, I took my Boy Scout canteen. I was always prepared. <laughs> and I went to my mother's liquor cabinet and I took a couple of jiggers out of each bottle and poured them into my two quart, it was a two quart, not a two liter, my two quart, don't listen to this, <laughs> my, my two quart canteen until it was full. I found out several years later that some of those liquor bottles were full of wine, not liquor, but I didn't know any difference. <laughs> and while I was at the Grateful Dead concert, 
I finish that two liter canteen of alcohol. I chain smoked. The cigarette machine didn't have my brand, so I ended up getting unfiltered camels, which seriously impacted my, my bloodstream. And sitting in the top row, I didn't need a joint. All the smoke was coming up. All of the marijuana smoke was coming up. I was thoroughly drunk, stone, wired. And when I left that concert and staggered home, uh, 15 and a half, so I couldn't drive. I did drive, but I couldn't. Um, I got home, and again, this is 1972, so there's no cable television, no satellite TV. Now, I lived in Washington, just outside of Washington, D.C., so we actually had seven channels, not the usual three. Uh, two of them were from Baltimore. But, so I, I sat down in my bedroom, 2 o'clock in the morning, watching television, scanning through the seven channels. And again, I was drunk, stone, wired, could not even think about going to sleep. And the only thing on television, you're, you're, you're way ahead of me, aren't you? <laughs> the Billy Graham crusade. <laughs> I don't remember anything of any of the details of what Billy Graham said. Uh, but by the time he was done with his message, I was not drunk, I was not stober, I was not stober. <laughs> I was not stoned, I was, I was, I was dead sober, and I had a visitation, which I believe to have been Jesus coming, and he said to me, tell my people I love them. So when I tell you that I was encouraged <laughs> to stick to the basics in, in this message. That's been the call of my life, to tell people I love them. Now, I'd like to tell you that the next morning I got up and went to church and I was the perfect saint. <laughs> I was not. Um, I, I entered what, was, what I referred to as my Saul faith. Before Paul was St. Paul, he was still uh, Shaul and uh, violently persecuting Christians. And that's what I did. I had met Jesus. I had no question that Jesus existed, but I hated his guts because my father had died when I was two years old. And I spent the next several years using what I did know about Scripture which for a 15, 16 year old boy was, was, was pretty good. Mm -hmm. And I would go to Christians who didn't know their way around the Bible real well, and I would confuse them. I was literally the devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, as I'm good about telling stories now, I was good at confusing Christians in those days. Uh, it was a few years later before I had a second touch. Um, in, uh, in uh, John, it's not staring at me. The, there's a passage where uh, there's a blind man who receives a touch from Jesus. John 9. And, John 9. Um, and he says, what do you see? And he says, I see, I see men, but they look like trees walking around. Mm -hmm. And it required a second touch. And after the second touch, he was able to see clearly. Right. Well, right. my first touch was in 1972. Yeah. My second touch was in 1975. Uh -huh. And it was getting back to this God loves you, very simple message. When I went to college at the University of Hartford, a, a school that <coughs> is about... 40%, at least in those days, was 40% Jewish enrollment. <coughs> in fact, we were more likely to have Jewish holidays off than we were to have Christian holidays. There was not a Christian fellowship on campus. <coughs> now, this is a story I tell when people say, does God have a sense of humor? I, I met a guy at, at, at orientation, and we hit it off, so we agreed to be roommates. He was a, an opera major. <coughs> I was a tuba major. And there was a third guy that started hanging around with us who was a French horn major. 
And we got along pretty well, so we agreed, the three of us, to be roommates freshman year. Well, these two guys named Wayne and Mike started the first Christian fellowship on the campus of the University of Hartford. And I don't mean some wishy-washy little <coughs> fellowship that I could easily confuse. They got a guy to come in from the Navigators. <laughs> <laughs> now, I gave him my, you know, little spiel about uh, supposed contradictions in the Bible and tried to confuse him. And he didn't even bother to try to argue with me. He just, you know, he let me rant and rave and, and continue to love me. And Wayne, the French horn major, uh, who has since gone on to be a pastor, um, every time that back in the room I would say to him something about the Bible being wrong or some area of confusion, he would look at me and, and he would say, you know, Steve, I don't believe the things you are saying. I know God loves me. Not I believe. I know God loves me. I know God loves you. And I know I love you too. Never tried to argue with me. Never tried to, to, to debate with me. He just showed me love. Well, I've got a bachelor's degree in mathematics. I've got a master's degree in organizational leadership. I've been through three different training programs for ministers, once in the Roman Church, once in the Episcopal Church, more recently with the International Assemblies of God. I've got, what would you say, Jesse, 4,000 books in my study? <laughs> I'd say 4 million. <laughs> um, I've spent five years as a youth minister. I work in hospice now. I've learned an awful lot. I've got gray hair and wrinkles like the Apostle John. And the, the essence of the gospel is what Jesus said to me in my bedroom after Jerry Garcia Grateful Dead concert 40 years ago this past August. And there's a song, surprise, that I would bring up a song, right? That really encapsulates that. And, and I'm going to ask my family to come up and share with you. This is one of the kinds of things that I see when I'm looking out over this congregation. Um, there have been a bunch of times that I want to get you guys to stop, turn around, and look. This wonderful woman here who dances the gospel, um, Barbara, who signs the songs, um, and and today uh, Kathy and Carmen, Carmen, were were in the back dancing um, long before they ever came up in the or a conga line, or whatever you call that. <laughs> and I really find it hard to continue. Very much like the, the story in the Old Testament where the, the, the Levites were ministering in, in song and music so faithfully that the ministers could not continue what they were doing. The Spirit of the Lord was so strong. And I experience that here a lot. Uh, this song, I'm pretty sure you all know it. At least the goy amongst us know it. Uh, and this is the most profound statement of theology that I have ever heard. And I would invite you to join me in the song. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. 
to uh, satisfy my speech professor's edict and get that good grade. By the way, I got a C. <laughs> uh, let me tell you what I told you. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God loves you so much that if you had been the only person here on earth, he still would have gone onto that cross for you. Jesus loves you, and so do I. Now please, pass it on in Yeshua's name. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. How delightful. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's all stand. There's a, an old song that comes to my mind, uh, uh, and if you uh, remember it, sing it with me. It goes like this. Yes, God's love takes good care of me. Yes, God's love takes good care of me. When the rain falls, the wind blows, storm is on the sea, I'll be safe. God's love takes care of me. Try it again. Yes, God's love takes good care of me. Hallelujah. Yes, God's love takes good care of me. When the rain Fall, the winds blow, the storm is on the sea, I'll be saved, God's love takes care of me. Oh, when the rains fall, the winds blow, the storm is on the sea, I'll be saved, God's love takes care of me. That was uh, in Steve's message. Amen. One of the best explanations of that there is a, a, a difference between no. just believe. Oh, I believe. I, it's like saying I think. I believe. I think. But the difference between believe and knowing. That uh, that's what stays with me is that and and Yochanan, John says that we we. We, uh, we believe and we know the love that God has towards us. Amen? Amen. Amen. We know and we believe the love that God has towards us. Amen. Here's the benediction. Please stay after the service. We have plenty of nosh. We have bagels today. Uh, as, as my stepfather used to tell me when I was a kid, uh, no, I don't want to say that. <laughs> this reminded, he used to tell me to take a flying leap off a rolling bagel. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I, I actually, I have, when I was in, I was a young believer. I lived in Alaska. I had a pastor, and one of my pastors, uh, Richard Strutz, wonderful brother in the Lord, and he said to me, "You know, Jeff, I always thought that uh, a bagel was a Jewish dog." <laughs> <laughs> But do stay, have some fellowship, please. And, uh, and dance, the dance that we're going to do for the Seder. Okay. We're going to practice 20 minutes. Okay. In about 20 in, about, minutes. in about 20 minutes, Kathy and Carmen are going to be practicing the dance that we'll do at the Passover Seder on March uh, 30th. So if you want to learn it, please join. In about 20 minutes, we'll be doing that. And then also, if you want Passover Seder tickets, please see me after the service. Uh, you only have another, uh, this is eight more days, this is another uh, week, but if you would like to get your tickets today, please see me. And then, um, other than that, uh, go in God's love. Let's say the benediction. Amen? Amen. Amen.
In the name of Yeshua, the Messiah. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, that's so far. Yeah. Uh, 
How's your week, James? Good?